I invite the first um, session, which is on, on understanding the continuum of multilingual writers. Um, and I hand it off to, to, to Relly to take it from here. So welcome everyone. Okay, thank you, Anu. Um, good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Nicole Hauser. I'm the director of Rutgers English Language Institute, or RELI. I'd like to take a moment to introduce my colleagues who will be presenting with me. Uh, Mark? Hi, I'm Mark Heitches, director of the Graduate English Language Learner Program. Uh, Nella? Hi, I'm Nella Navarro, and I'm the director for the English for Academic Purposes Program. And Natalie? Hello, everybody. My name is Natalie DeSorbo, and I'm the RU Pathway Program Manager. So our talk today, um, we're beginning um, with our theme, we want to contextualize uh, our panel today and present guiding principles for teaching in a multilingual space with, ex with specific examples from Rutgers English Language Institute. I would first like to provide some background on RELI and the student demographics of RELI to introduce and contextualize our presentation. A majority of students at RELI have most of their lived experience and academic experience outside of the context of the United States. Now I make this distinction because it is reflective of the title and focus of this talk, understanding the continuum of multilingual writers. Examples from our talk will be about the international student population, that specific multilingual student population at Rutgers. Um, however, th this is just, they only represent part of the multilingual student population here. So um, before we begin in, in the chat function, if you haven't done so already, as you can see uh, in the little boxes at the top of the slide, I would like you all to type the languages that you have learned that you speak, that you have learned formally, informally, at home, in academic contexts, all levels of, and proficiencies. Um, and in the yellow box, uh, that's the representation of our uh, linguistic uh, proficiencies in, in the rally leadership. Okay, so I ask this question regarding participants' linguistic backgrounds at all Rutgers workshops that I host uh, and events for both students and faculty and our community in order to remind us or to create an awareness <laughs> um, that we are in a multilingual space. And I have cited um, recent work here by Robinson Hall and Navarro, our own Nella Navarro, um, that highlights the everyday translingualism of undergraduate and graduate communities at um, higher education institutions in the United States. Uh, multilingualism is the norm and not the exception uh, at Rutgers New Brunswick. And below that square, um, I have a another list of languages, and these are the languages that uh, were reported by peer tutors in the learning centers, undergraduate peer tutors, when I hosted a workshop on working on tutoring in multilingual spaces for that group. I also begin here and highlight this fact because research conducted uh, in the language engagement project, and I have that uh, a quote from these findings in the larger square, or the, the larger bubble, um, show that uh, students feel that speaking a language in addition to English is not largely valued at the university. Uh, the results of this survey highlight experience, uh, experiences of resident multilingual students, um, which is one of the fastest growing demographics of undergraduates in US institutions of higher learning. And I have um, cited work here um, by Hooper and Rucker, uh, Ortmeyer Hooper and Rucker, um, that highlight that multilingual resident students are often uh, an overlooked demographic of students because they can re remain anonymous um, because they don't have the, the TOEFL exam scores and aren't labeled in this ESL way, um, like international populations. So multilingualism extends far beyond uh, international student populations. Um, also rega regarding international students, assumptions are often made about seemingly homogenous groups. And if you see in the smaller bubble, there's another list of languages um, beginning with Mandarin, Cantonese, Russian, French, German, uh, Japanese, and multiple dialects. These languages were reported by one singular class of RU Pathway students who were all from China. 
So these traditional dichotomies dividing ESL and other students perpetuates this mythical monolingual resident American student, <laughs> um, which is simply inaccurate. And I highlight this because this results in both discriminatory and pedagogically unsound practices. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at the square below that circle there, uh, our recent LEP ambassadors program that connects international RELI students with uh, resident American students, the most common pairing was a student from China and a Chinese American student. And both of the students have a range of proficiencies and familiarities linguistically and culturally with one another. As I move to key considerations then, um, you see that the first consideration to take into account and the most important one is understanding the diversity of experiences across populations. And now related to that, I note uh, and call attention to understanding and considering the relationship between language, culture, and context then um, and the diver within that diversity of experiences. So in understanding, it's important to understand the background and experiences of students. Uh, so students, for example, students new to the United States uh, will also um, be new to the language of learning and the educational culture, relationships between peers, expectations in the classroom. Um, and I'd like to also highlight and note um, the different registers of language as well, social language, as well as academic languages. The next key consideration uh, to take into account is to address and understand myths and facts about language teaching and learning as they relate to what the facts of what research in linguistics and writing studies tells us versus some mythical, some practices that stem from language attitudes and ideologies. So this is important because as educators, we all evaluate students' language. We are all writing teachers, regardless of disciplinary background. So it is imperative to understand the best practices informed by research in the field. A great example of this is one that I have noted here is English only um, and associated assimilationist policies and practices. Research has always shown in bilingualism and has consistently shown that the cognitive and social benefits of multilingualism. But in our educational system, um, broadly and in higher education, the policies and practices have not always reflected this. Um, English only is a policy and reflects language policing. It is not a best practice pedagogically. Um, with that being said, as we move into um, more uh, specific guiding principles, uh, I just want to reiterate that the best practices then, taking all of this into account and the diversity of the, the continuum of multilingual writers, uh, the best practices are responsive and contextualized, and there's not a one size fits all approach. I will now detail the guiding principles of our curriculum in Rally based on these key considerations and our expertise within the field. And then each program director will then detail how these principles apply to their specific contexts. Um, first, we take an inquiry-based, strengths-based and grounded approach um, in our curriculum. Uh, we build in assignments where students reflect on um, and, and define their cultural and linguistic resources and abilities and backgrounds, not only to share um, and learn about one another in the classroom, but this also begins to create an awareness and assist students in articulating their communicative strengths. This creates the foundations for strength-based scaffolding and the, and the negotiation of meaning when discussing audience and writing expectations across cultures and contexts. Uh, and finally, uh, an approach that I'd like to highlight before moving to each um, pro program example is that we implement a functional grammar approach when talking about grammar and uh, giving feedback um, in our program. And functional grammar approach contextualizes and explains structural choices that students make and how they affect meaning locally and globally within a text um, rather than a decontextualized decontextualized, error-focused 
approach of marking up papers <laughs> with no explanation as to why those choices might not be appropriate um, for the audience expectations. Uh, we also highlight and bring students' attention to successful choices that they have made in their writing, lexically, lexically structurally, and rhetorically. So I will now turn the presentation over to my colleagues at RELI, uh, who will explain how these guiding principles apply in each of their contexts. And we'll begin with uh, Dr. Mark Keiches, the director of Grad ELL. Hello, thank you, Nicole. Um, so in Grad ELL, we offer graduate level academic writing and communication courses, as well as a research symposium twice a year and weekly conversation groups. In Grad ELL, we strive to provide differentiated support based on the stage of each student's academic development. From first year master's students struggling with time management and critical reading to doctoral students finalizing their dissertations and entering the job market. We are in essence a writing in a disciplines program. Our faculty help all students, irrespective of linguistic or cultural background, prepare to communicate both in disciplinary and interdisciplinary contexts. Our program is student directed and responsive. We facilitate a self-assessment and goal setting exercise and hold one-on-one -on -one consultation with every student at the beginning of every semester. The individual learning plans we develop form the basis for lessons and consultations with the student that semester. Our courses feature no extra assignments or busy work. Our classes promise not to distract students uh, from the primary fields of study by placing additional academic burdens on them. Gradiolo courses are small and incorporate extensive one-on-one -on -one instruction and small group interaction. Also, our courses are non-credit um, so they're an excellent value as students incur no additional cost when enrolling. Finally, and this is really important, Grad ELL is not a fix-it shop, uh, nor a remedial program. While we do address grammatical and lexical issues at the sentence level, our Rally language consultants are not prescriptivists by any stretch of the imagination. Our program aims to provide comprehensive, discipline-specific academic support at the point the support is most needed by our students. Our goal is to cultivate holistic, long-term relationships with graduate writers throughout the time that they spend at Rutgers. Uh, next slide, please. So because our program seeks to be responsive to student needs and support them throughout their graduate academic careers, one example of a course that we provide is a TA seminar and practicum course, which is designed to help prepare international students who have been assigned teaching assistant positions for the diversity they will encounter in the undergraduate classroom here at Rutgers and for the expectations of a US institution. One of the ways we do that is through a curriculum that is both designed to be culturally responsive and to teach prospective TAs to be culturally responsive in their own classrooms. For example, during the module focused on inclusive teaching practices for diverse students, ITAs are asked to reflect on how to connect strategies for inclusive teaching, for cultural, linguistic, and cognitive diversity, to name only a few, into their own disciplinary teaching practice. This then prepares them to write their own diversity statements as a part of their teaching philosophy, a critical writing component of any graduate student um, hoping to enter the professorate. So if you have any questions about Grad ELL, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be happy to give you more information. I'll now turn it over to my colleague, Nella Navarro. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nicole. And again, thank you everyone for being here and for our, our hosts uh, and our co-sponsors. Uh, I'm Nella Navarro, and um, I would like to talk to you uh, very specifically about um, our program, which um, I think many of you know, it's the English for Academic Discourse Program. I'm the director of this program, and we support the first year experience or first year writing program. I'm happy to say that um, we are on the cusp of um, changing the, the name of the program to, uh, to, to adequately reflect, reflect very much what uh, Nicole pointed out in terms of the RELI uh, guiding principles and many of the same uh, practices at the undergraduate level that Mark has just noted. Um, I want to point out that this isn't simply a change for the name, for the sake of a, a name change. It represents a shift in the way we think about difference in the context of the critical first year writing experience of our ELL, EAL students, English as an additional language. 
as you can see, I'm, I'm talking about that notion of rethinking difference and toward a lexicon of inclusion, guided by Rally principles, cutting edge uh, research in college composition and applied linguistics, as Nicole uh, pointed out. Our program is asking us to change the way we think about difference, particularly, specifically language difference in our undergraduate uh, students, particularly in the first year, uh, which is, of course, the students that I am working with in particular. Uh, and, and these changes, of course, will address very much, um, I think, the title of our, our talk, which is how we're responding to the, the work of our students. We recognize and engage with language difference as the norm and not as a de deviation, as Nicole pointed out, from this mythical standard uh, that does not exist. Uh, and so for us, um, we want to engage with ideas of difference as it's critical at Rutgers because at Rutgers, as Nicole pointed out earlier, multilingualism is the mainstream. And this shift compels us to call, to use what I call a lexicon, a lexicon of inclusion when speaking about our perspectives, our practices, our work, and most importantly, our students. And by this, I mean the use of a, of a, a move away from a deficit language, uh, which is what is traditionally used to speak about first year students uh, and uh, to a more strength-based approach. We made changes in the curriculum, as you noted in the first slide. Nicole, thank you for moving. To um, We made curricular changes, and programmatic changes, pedagogical changes, and of course, community building changes. And how, what does this look like uh, in particular into our, in our courses? It's a move, we have two courses, writing across, uh, writing across cultures, which are, are EAP1, and we have uh, our, academic writing in the United States, which is our EAD2. And each of these courses, you'll see a, a shift from uh, a deficit model language. Uh, so the idea of teaching them language, we're teaching them writing. Uh, and we embrace and recognize what the students are giving us in terms of their global, their global contributions. We begin with, uh, you know, uh, a, a activating activation of prior knowledge and a uh, looking into what the students already have in terms of their, their writing strategies and their writing uh, capabilities in the language that they have already, already been uh, uh, using uh, their, their native language. Uh, this is especially uh, clear in the series of multimodal, uh, multimodal tasks and assignments that students have, such as our, our podcast our EEP uh, interns who work with us and inform many of the choices that we make in our e EAP classrooms. The classroom, the EAP classroom is seen as a site of negotiation and not a prescription. It means that, um, and I, I speak now in the, in the, in this world of, uh, of, uh, of COVID, uh, in our in our asynchronous sessions and our synchronous sessions, we employ interactive learning practices that take into account the differences between Eastern classroom practices and Western classroom practices. We emphasize uh, process and scaffolding, so that, uh, for example, we don't we no longer have exams we used to. We don't have high stakes assignments. Assignments are very very carefully scaffolded, and the level of detailed response to student writing is contextualized and relevant to the individual student. We have students uh, uh, coming to us, as Mark just pointed out, in one-on-one -on -one consultations where there's a discussion and negotiating a, a meaning so that we can really get at what, what stage of writing uh, the student is struggling with. Uh, and we speak about stages of writing um, across, the, across culture. So students can talk to us, for example, about the stages of writing in their own language and what that might look like. So they can bring those strategies, those effective ideas into and, and effective practices into the EP classroom. Uh, I'm about to end here. We, we especially have a really unique set of readings that are linguistically and culturally appropriate and, and, and linguistically and culturally challenging uh, ch choices and selections that are multimodal so that we can really get at uh, what students are doing outside of our classes across the curriculum in other writing classes. And finally, this work that we do is, uh, is, is, is also part of our desire to create community. So we have a variety of opportunities where students can ask questions, engage in their linguistic repertoire, feel that they're part of the university community and that they're part of the broader uh, goals of the university, which is, as we say, uh, we want to be sure that we leverage and value what they bring to their, the table, which is a global perspective and a contribution to the global university, no matter what their visa status is. And finally, this work is committed, of course, to linguistic justice. I'm happy to talk about more specifically what are the kinds of ways in which we uh, do this work in, uh, in our classes. Thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Natalie. 
Thank you, Nella. So I'm going to talk about the RU Pathway program. RU Path serves non-matriculated international students from all over, um, or multilingual students from all over the world, mostly international students. Currently, we have students from Argentina and mainland China in the program. Each course in the program is design, uh, designed to promote language acquisition and familiarize students with American educational conventions and learning skills like time management, note taking. Upon successful completion of the program, these students become matriculated undergraduate students. Um, I want to highlight a few of the guiding principles that Nicole mentioned earlier and how we implement them into our UPATH. So weekly activities and long-term assignments are scaffolded according to the student's skill levels and needs. Each assignment has multiple steps that build up to the final product, and each step in the process is clearly defined for the students. Some assignments are new to our students, such as creating a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so it's really important that we are transparent about what we do and why we do it um, and how it will help the students in the long term, even after they graduate from PATH. Synchronous lessons or recordings in this context uh, include modeling of language skills. At this stage in their language development, the students really benefit from seeing and hearing someone else's thought process and language structures during, let's say, an analysis task. Um, I often implement the I do, we do, you do structure, which I have an example of um, on this slide here. We were doing a lesson on rhetorical devices and I modeled I modeled how I use vocabulary and structures first and then allow them slowly, you know, uh, build up the responsibility on their part and they can explore with that vocabulary in their own way. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so an empathetic approach to language feedback is crucial in the RU Path program. Students often enter this program with very low confidence in their language skills. So we avoid overloading the students with a lot of grammar comments in our language feedback. Instead, the language feedback is selective, focused on patterns of errors that are relevant to the assignment at hand, but also to their future writing. Additionally, instructors are encouraged to approach unclear word choices with curiosity, right? I really see these as meaningful cultural exchanges. There is logic behind their choice. There is cultural experience behind their choice. So how can we negotiate that meaning together? Students are also encouraged to be inquisitive to build their confidence. Um, Rally faculty designed a course called Writing Workshop this semester, so the students can do just that, build their confidence. They explore their writing interests, they submit a proposal, receive feedback, uh, and display their finished product on our blog called Our Creative Path. So this is just a screenshot of the blog so far. I'm still populating it with student work. They're writing poems, book reviews, many different types of writing. Um, the link will be available on our Rally website very soon, so I can't wait to share that with everybody in a more official way. What ties the experience in RU Path together, though, the driving force of this program is viewing the students as experts in their own culture and their first language. This expertise informs all the work they will produce for us. So we incorporate discussion circles and assignments into the courses in which the students can exhibit that expertise um, as they navigate through their English learning journey. In this way, the instructors learn from students, students learn from instructors. So in this last screenshot here, um, I had asked the past students in IEAD, Intensive English as Academic Discourse, to analyze how music is linked to cultural identity. That was the prompt. One student decided to write about traditional elements such as musical instruments and idioms within modern Chinese pop music. She beautifully captured the purpose of this assignment, but we needed to work together to negotiate meaning, clarify word choices, and revise translations of lyrics. It was very challenging, but it was one of the most satisfying experiences I've had as a teacher so far. And I can't wait to continue this practice with future students. Okay. So I'll pass it back to Nicole for any final comments. Well, or... I guess, yeah, thanks. So we have, um, you know, we're close on the end of the time for the next, um, um, 
presentation, but I don't know if there's, you know, if Laura, if you, there are any questions um, um, or, or, or like a couple um, of a theme that we could answer um, before moving on. Uh, <clears throat> There were a bunch in um, the questions that we got when you all registered. Thank you so much for submitting questions ahead, um, as Tom noted, uh, on um, feedback. So um, specifically, um, feedback in professional writing classes was queried. Um, uh, how much feedback is enough? Um, what you think is the best way to provide feedback in a positive sense? Um, and how can you make sure that feedback is being understood? So a lot of questions on feedback. And there's also one from um, Dr. Tatiana Rodriguez um, on Eastern uh, versus Western practices. Well, we could, um, since we're at the end, if since other um, presentations will be addressing the feedback and maybe we could, I don't want to cut into other time, maybe we could go go on to the next presentations and return to these questions collectively um, that, you know, that works for, that would work for, for me. So I think that would probably be best. So thank you everyone. And um, continue with the, with the next present presentation. The next presentation uh, is on providing feedback to multilingual um, students across the curriculum, um, which is uh, a lot of your questions are um, about that. And it is going to be led by Dr. Madhav Kafe, who is the instructor at the graduate um, writing program. So Madhav, um, I give this to you now. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Gupta. So I'm in a strange position here. So I was in a panic mode last night because my modem died and um, I was using my phone's data to the computer and it's not working now. So I, am, I have to use my phone itself. So it's a little bit strange. Uh, I mean, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So thank you, Flora, for your support in sharing the slide. So let me try to, I mean, like, uh, can you see, can you also see me? Or like I have turned the video on, but if that is going to, mm -hmm. We can okay, see you. Yes, you're, we can see fine. you, Mana. Okay, I'm really sorry to do this very unprofessionally because I am holding this device. It's in my okay. Hand, but, uh, it, it's all good. You. Let's get started, Mana. Okay, thank you. So today I will I'll be sharing perspective of a subset of multilingual students. So these are refugee students with refugee backgrounds. And I am often asked, okay, how many refugee students do we have in US higher education? And that's the tricky part is our colleagues earlier presentation indicated there are many subset of students who could be, who could pass anonymously in universities. And so let's go to the next slide, please. Flora. So the refugee students that I will be talking about today are ex Bhutanese refugees. So their families were expelled from Bhutan in 1980, starting from 1899, sorry, 1989 due to Bhutan's one nation, one language policy. And they have, were living in the refugee camps in Nepal for almost two decades until 2007. There was the agreement uh, through the third country resettlement and US was one of the countries to resettle them. And that's how these students were here in the US. Next slide, please. So my students, so my study, this is a part of a larger study coming from my dissertation. So I followed three refugee students uh, as, the, as a multiple longitudinal multiple test study. I called the students Gyan, Lal, and Raj. And they were in, uh, in this university. They called themselves Dreamland University, which is a Northeastern US large research university. Uh, so they were already graduated, they had already graduated from one or two years of high schools and were there when I met them first. Next slide, please. So just to give a little bit more background, so if you, you can see in that picture, so 
in the refugee camps, their education was on Mexican schools like that, that. And within one or two years of coming from the refugee camps, they were in this research university through a program called CAMP, the Federal Program College Assistance Migrant Program. And now they have to deal with these huge textbooks, uh, even one or two books, even within a single course. And then now we will see what kind of challenges they start to have. Next slide, please. So here, this is the overall scenario for two of my students, Gyan and Lal. So you can see their overall GPA, but I would like to draw your attention towards the, that row where I, I have used the arrow, spring 14. So before that, they were taking the courses recommended by camp. Most of them were remedial courses and they were doing okay. But when they started taking the credit bearing courses from spring 14, then you can see the GPA went real drastically down. So Lal's GPA is 0 0.69, total GPA for his semester. Next slide, please. But the, but the good news is all of them, all my three students graduated within five years. Uh, from, from, like, so I was following them throughout the five years for that larger study, find, trying to find out what kind of academic literacy challenges they were having and what strategies they used to negotiate those challenges. So let's, and then today I, will, I would like to focus on the issue of feedback. Next slide, please. So relating to feedback, what those students say, uh, and uh, this is what I am making up here. So those, those literacy sponsors, I'm using the term by Deborah Brandt, who, who were willing to meet those students where they are, they found the feedback from them very useful. And if there were assignments or assessments where the expectations were put out clearly, that they also found that very helpful. And the third number three is a kind of an overlap with the first one. But what I mean to say is, it's really important to know the student. Uh, it's not only for now, like where they are now, but also if possible, ideally their personal and academic trajectories, how, what kind of, from what kind of scenario they are in, in your class. And finally, it's not only one person's, uh, let's say responsibility, but if we could create some kind of community, communal feedback, that's what they found really helpful. Next slide, please. So in this slide, uh, Gan is talking about, yes, I went to the U.S. high school, but comparing what we did in U.S. high school, the US, U.S. high school did not teach us the vocabulary that would be needed in the university, in the research university. So the, he says there was no vocabulary for us. So we found the complex vocabularies in academic discourse really, really complex, really challenging. And we tend to forget the multiple transitions these refugee background students are going through. So there is trauma, there is, they are in the new country, in the new education system with how the new institution works. Next slide, please. So this in this slide, Raj is saying, well, I did not know how university works. So he's comparing with his peers who went to US high, high, US high schooling and says, well, all of them seem to know how the university works. But when I was in US high school, I just thought going to the university meant you just go to a school, you go to class and you just do your homework and you get A's. That's what I thought. And that's how I came to the university. But apparently that was not going to help him much. Next slide, please. Because as you can see in this slide, the academic discourse is laden with multiple, let's say, examples from the popular culture, as you can see. So this is a course, communication and speech, 100, uh, the mandatory course, the third is part of it for a speech communication. But there, you can see there are multiple characters being used, Team Thibault, then characters from Bing Bang Theory, and to their credit, the professor is asking their, okay, the rhetorical questions, you know Big Bang Theory, right? So what's a Big Bang Theory and so on and so forth. And the student also says there are also reality shows sometimes being used. So all of these create a lot of complexity for these students. Next slide, please. 
And also complexity can be created by how the assessment, the questions in, uh, in assessments are phrased. And Raj says in this slide, so I am a very good student in mathematics uh, because I used to teach many of my peers in high school, but coming to the university, I knew all the content and my teacher was really nice. But I stayed really, I studied really hard. But when I went to take the exam, he gave us multiple choice questions. Now, all the options mean the same. I don't know the meaning of many words. So this subtle difference between, the, between different options in multiple choice. So that was one of the major challenges in the early, like these large classes for all of my students. Next slide, please. Now, here is a... An example from nutrition course, one of the professors trying to help student lol because he had done poorly in his quizzes and he went to talk with the professor, okay, how can I do better for next time? And for some, somehow, because the student is from also Nepal, so they, their conversation turns to Buddha, Professor Ox about, do you know about little Buddha? I mean, I don't know very much about the detail, but the, this is what the student is sharing me in the informal chat. Then later he sends a video of, of Gautama Buddha to the professor, to this professor. And after that, somehow they create some kind of alignment through Buddha and he ends up getting so much engaged in this course and ends up getting an A. Next slide, please. Now, here is another example of in an assignment uh, that not being clear, not written clearly from like, what is the difference between an outline and a draft? So this is the assignment draft is due on that day and it's very small. You probably, maybe next slide there is a transcript because this is from Viber. Uh, so this is, the, this is the transcript the student is saying. So a student kind of messages me in using Viber, the, one of the apps. So I need your urgent help because my professor said, this is my outline, but not my draft. So let's go to the next slide because I think that's there is a, so in this slide, so this is the, what is written in the syllabus. So if you look at number five, so there is, I mean, number four, the student has to review at least 10 research articles uh, are related to the theme of nutrition and has to kind of uh, organize them in an outline first. But by the time they have to turn in, they have to kind of create their own paper based on that literature. But what the student did, it turns out was, he just added introduction and conclusion to that detailed outline and submitted that is his paper. He did not know that he had to synthesize all these different articles according to the, um, let's say, matching themes. I mean, there you can see the appointment is there with the um, professor, even with the going to the professor and talking about what he needed to do, he was having difficulty to understand this. So then we, I, I had to kind of uh, walk him through, oh, this is what you need to do you need to synthesize all of that. And that's the difference between the draft and like the outline and the draft. Next slide, please. Now here's another, another case where a student found his professor's reaction are like helpful. So he, he turned in a report for a nuclear engineering course and professor kind of took significant amount like a amount of his grades simply because he could not fix the grammar. So he was, at this time, a little bit more confident because he's in already in year fifth. So he went to the professor and said, professor, I, it took me nine hours to fix, to, to develop this report. And it would take me another nine hours if I had to fix all these grammatical issues. And he kind of uh, played this card. Look, I am coming from this background. And then after that, professor really appreciated, okay, I'll just ignore your grammatical issues. And so this willingness to, meet the student where he was, they, the student found really helpful. Next slide, please. Now, here is a, an example of how counselors could also try to understand the student more because Lal goes and talks with this advisor. 
I'm not doing that great in my bio 141 because I think I did really bad in my exam and I'm considering dropping it. Should I drop it? Then the counselor says, if you really, if you think like you did wrong, yes, go and drop it. But he dropped the course, but then found out even a D grade would be okay for him because he's not going to measure in biology. So, so he thought he regretted that decision. Oh, I wish I knew my counselor had told, okay, if you can bring a D, that's going to be okay with you. So then he started to kind of learn from other people and for difficult courses, the students now started going to community colleges because the difficult, the same, and they could transfer the credit for these difficult courses, but they found the courses in those community colleges a lot easier. And he says on the right-hand side, if I had followed the counselor, my speed would have been as slow as a tortoise. So they had to that have this system to kind of, uh, to, to, to graduate on time. Next slide, please. Now, it does not mean there were, there were not other literacy sponsors whose feedback they found really helpful. For example, in this Health Policy Administration, one of the TAs provides a very detailed feedback to GAN, and he's able to, let's go to the next slide, please, because I don't want to, yeah. So he's able to revise it really really in depth uh, going look at the, the track chains there. So based on the suggestion provided by the TA, but in the later stages like of their academic journey, let's go to the next slide please. So what my students found more useful in, in terms of feedback is they kind of uh, where they were able to connect with their peers who spoke similar languages. So Lal, so Neil learned a little bit of Spanish when he was working in a kind of a meat factory in, in Philadelphia. And he offered, with that help of, with the help of these bits and pieces of Spanish, he was able to connect with uh, one of the peers from El Salvador who had done his, her high schooling in the US. So he got a lot of help through her. Then there were Nepali graduate students in physics, chemistry, or in many STEM fields. So when they were playing soccer, I, I used to hear them talking about issues, like the concepts from these disciplines. And they said, well, we, we understood this concept because these guys, meaning these brothers, the graduate students from Nepal were there. And also some of the professors, the literacy sponsors, they actually went to their programs because they were organizing a lot of uh, community programs through their student organizations. So their presence there kind of helped them to be more motivated to, to understand the concept that they were teaching. Next slide, please. So here, I mean, I would say, what kind of feedback students found mostly helpful? So I am kind of coming up with the three C's here. So if the literacy sponsor was able to create some kind of alignment, engagement, even small things like just addressing the, addressing the students by their names. In a, this one of the students said, in my physics course, there are like 500 students, but my physics professors remembers my name. So that means that motivates them to kind of, to understand these difficult concepts. So you cannot imagine how that just addressing the student by your name can be helpful. And like the, the, that example from Buddha and getting, enabling the student to achieve good grade in that course. And maybe if we could also tell in different ways, what is like the difference between what are the expectations we are, what, what are the things we are expecting from the students? Uh, we can take for granted students will get it even simple things like the difference between outline and draft. And finally, if we could create some sort of some safe space where we could cultivate this communal feedback capitalizing on their transnational and translingual affordances, the reporters, I think that would be the best way to go according to these students. So 
I, uh, I would like to leave you here with this. I mean, this might be a little bit uh, extreme case because I'm presenting the case of Bhutanese refugees, the refugee students, but there is some similarity and also a difference with those and other domestic and international multilingual students. And I hope we can at least get something from the, from the examples of these students. Thank you. Thank you, Mada. That was excellent. And, um, and, and thank you for being so creative uh, with, the, with the phone. Um, I think everybody agrees that this was an excellent presentation. Uh, do we have any questions or maybe the question that were already asked? Uh, we have a little bit of time. Uh, we have about 10 minutes where we could actually answer some of those questions. Um, Flora, could you just repeat those questions? So we had a question actually within chat, uh, you mentioned before Anu about Eastern to Western practices. Um, uh, Tatiana Rodriguez um, brought that out. Um, maybe you'd like to expand on that, um, Tatiana, the curious about Eastern versus Western practices, maybe Madhav could uh, field some of that or the other panelists. Sure, it was mentioned that there were differences. And so I was curious, I teach public speaking and very often have international students, mostly from China. So as the term came up, I thought well, it'd be interesting to hear what are the differences. I feel like I have a sense anecdotally, but I'd love to hear, since I don't have really any idea what education experience is like in the Eastern side. I mean, if I could talk based on the experience of these refugee students. So in Nepal, teacher, maybe in South Asia. So the teachers are, teachers' word is like, so that's the, that's the syllabus there. So, and the memory is given a lot of emphasis. So when that student went to the counselor, whether I should drop that course, then the students thought teachers know about me and what's good for me. And then he took the word. So now here, the maybe we are, we are trying to provide some agency to the student. If you think you did bad, you can drop the course. So we don't want to just put, yeah, you should drop that course. Or no, don't drop it. But we are trying to give, provide that agency because and that's the expectation here. But, but the student was expecting, maybe my counselor is going to look into, okay, what's your grade? Like what kind of grade you might end up coming up with? And let's kind of going with, going with the detailed scenario and giving more, well, looks like you are going to get a D. So I think that's going to be okay. So that maybe that might be <laughs> this Eastern and Western expectations. Uh, so like looking at the teachers and most of the time this may be also coming up with this, the multilingual repertoire, you feel like, I feel like nodding things look like I understood everything. The student went to the teacher's one-to-one -one conference and felt like understood everything, but never realized he didn't understand the difference between the draft and outline. So we might have to think about, okay, this student is coming from this kind of culture where they don't really question the professor. So did you really get it? So maybe even going down, kind of uh, making it easier for them. So that's what I would say for the, I mean, I, I'm trying to bring these big boxes of Eastern and Western, but, but I, would, I would love to hear responses from my colleagues. I can address it because I, I, I mentioned it, if you, if you don't mind, I, uh, and I was speak, speaking of practices, and I'll just contextualize it again for our um, EAP, uh, first year writing courses. What I was referring to was, um, I'll, I'll give two specific examples uh, and uh, add to Madhav's point, that we need to be really explicit um, in a very detailed way uh, because the, student, the student's idea and definition of what we're, you know, in, in a way it's, it's removing assumptions. The student's idea and definition of what's something that we think might be uh, understood is not necessarily understood. And one specific example that uh, I know a lot of us do in EAP is we really are very detailed about what a student's main idea or main argument is and where it's situated or located. And that changes with discipline, it changes with class. 
Um, we often in the American English context will tell students that we are looking for the main argument, the claim, the thesis, whatever your discipline calls it in the first or ideally second paragraph at the latest. And I have found, um, uh, and the research tells us, uh, and, and we do this in EAP, that very often our students will tell us, oh, my professor said I, I didn't have an argument or the argument came too late. Uh, and something as simple as showing them that they do have the argument, that they have put it at the end, because let's say, I'll use China as an example, because I know some of our colleagues mentioned it in, uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in, in previous uh, discussions. Many of us are teaching students um, who are from China or Korea. And in those languages, the thesis is something that comes at the end. You arrive at your argument. You don't begin with it. And so having, you know, being able to recognize that that's, that's a possibility uh, uh, and leveraging that and knowing, having the student tell you what, where they have put it and how they can recognize the idea of the audience. So not that there's something wrong with their thesis, but that they have to remember the audience. And in this case, the audience would be an American English professor in whatever course they're in. So that's, that's, that's what I was thinking when I was, um, thinking about you know, this idea that, that we want to try to leverage. Um, and a last point I'll make is Mata was reminding us that in RELI, we look at all of our students, the, the wide range of our students' linguistic and cultural repertoire, so. There's a follow-up question on specifically about grammar um, and uh, by Shauna Jamison Cardi. And thank you, Shauna, for sending that ahead as well about the weight that English grammar should carry in our writing courses because grammar is an important part of learning in any language is, is um, her point here. And uh, so uh, do we wanna wait until other panelists presentations on this or do we feel that we wanna talk about this now about grammar and um, how much grammar impacts our feedback. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit in my presentation if that would be helpful. That's perfect, Sean. So, so I think that um, given the time, uh, we can move on to the next uh, presentation. Uh, by Dr. Sean Gonzalez, um, and she is a lecturer at the writing program at Princeton. And she is going to be talking about close reading and commenting on international student writing. And, and thank you, Sean, for agreeing to uh, address the grammar issue within your presentation. Thank you. Absolutely, my pleasure. So if you'll give me a moment to ensure that my slides are sharing properly here. Thank you. We'll see. Perfect. So if, um, if kind of the broader context that we've been thinking about is a continuum of multilingual writers, um, I'm thinking about students who are at a really different part of that continuum than the students that Madhav just spoke about. Um, so I teach first year writing at Princeton and the theme of my course is related to um, language and identity. So I have very many students in my class who are from a, um, a domestic multilingual student population. Uh, a lot of my students are um, have parents who speak a language that they themselves have learned, um, but maybe do not identify as fluent in. And I also have a lot of um, international students in my classroom as well. So if I could just give me one moment, I'm also uh, like mud of navigating multiple uh, devices here. So I want to just start by thinking about what is the what's the role of grammar and mechanics in your own commenting practice on student writing? So when I speak with colleagues about teaching international students, I often hear some version of the word unprepared. And sometimes this is related to the students themselves, right? Uh, the focus is on how students are unprepared to use academic English at the level that's assumed for the course. Other times the focus is on faculty who feel somehow unprepared to support students' language development. And to some extent, many faculty, myself included here, are unprepared. Most of us lack the kind of specialized training in the field of language acquisition to, you know, really target language issues based on a student's specific language background or where they are in their language trajectory. And I, I want to think about how this is not necessarily an impediment to us providing really helpful feedback to our students 
but kind of an opportunity for us to rethink the way we're talking about grammar and mechanics with all of our students. Um, because I think this overemphasis on the mechanics of edited academic English is not always the place where we can be most effective as instructors. So really thinking about um, what we're hearing from our multilingual international students can give us an opportunity to really think about how we can serve our broader student population as well. So as I have learned more about student multilingualism, my approach has really shifted to focus less on the language development knowledge that I lack and more on what I can offer my students in the context of the specific focus of my course. So because my course focuses on first year um, introductory research development, through introductory project, uh, research project design, I don't necessarily have to prioritize grammar and mechanics in order to give students um, the really actionable advice that I want to give them. So um, in my own practice, I really try to avoid commenting on grammar and mechanics when it is not actually necessary or useful for the students. So as a point of contrast here, I want to talk a little bit about my approach to grammar when I first began teaching. So around when I first started teaching, my mother gave me this mug as a gift. And uh, then I showed it to my husband who said, oh, if only it were silent. And unfortunately, that is some of the energy that I brought to commenting uh, early in my academic career. And I really, I came to this from a place of really trying to um, give students helpful suggestions for places where they could revise, really kind of an editing energy here. Um, but what I found is I commented in what became a really extensive and time-consuming commenting practice is that um, I wasn't necessarily giving my students the tools to distinguish between what comments were helpful and relevant to where they were in a particular process and what was um, kind of just an overwhelming amount of comments or focusing on next level issues of style where if they were trying to publish it in the New York Times, it might be nice to polish up, but it really wasn't impeding um, communication. And what I found was that these sorts of comments were crowding out some of the really helpful information that I wanted to share about um, what was working well in the student's analysis and where they could really um, start to level up that analysis in ways that were really going to pay off for the development of their arguments. Now, in retrospect, this emphasis on spotting um, language variation and identifying it as error seems really shocking given the focus of the dissertation research I was doing at the same time. Um, so my training is in comparative literature and I work consistently with writers who are working with the intersection of more than one language. So my research background is in multilingualism in Caribbean literature. So I would be in my research looking at texts like this that are certainly not written in ways that prioritize the comfort or ease of an American uh, US reader of English. However, when I would then turn and look at my student writing, I was focusing on an entirely different um, set of assumptions about how easy the reading experience should be for me. Now, this disconnect between my willingness to engage with language variation in my research and my attempts to, from, from a place of caring, but my attempts to minimize it in my students' writing is really a well-documented phenomenon. So here are some of the scholars that have helped me kind of develop my thinking about this topic over time. Um, but I want to point out in particular at Nancy Bu Ayash, and she writes about how um, the field of literary studies in particular has a really troubling relationship to language variation, where this is something that is often really celebrated in the work of our published authors in our own research sources. And then there are sometimes opportunities to kind of tolerate language variation in student pre-writing or even in student creative work. But then when it comes to uh, the final product or whatever we're perceiving as high writing, then um, a really kind of homogenous set of monolingual expectations 
kind of settles in. And um, this is something that I have been really thinking about in my own position as a, as a teacher of writing and as a teacher of literature, um, but often as a teacher who's been working within contexts where I do not set the, uh, the grading criteria for the courses that I'm teaching. So I've been working within larger programs that have um, you know, the grading criteria kind of established at the program level. So given this kind of disconnect, I think from my perspective, the biggest change that I've been able to make in my own practice is to spend significantly less time attending to language variation, thinking about when is there language variation that I can choose not to engage with. And by really ignoring the language variation when it's not the thing that's most useful for us to comment on. I think this is really makes space for us to comment on the places where we really can add something of value to the students. And we offer them so much more, I think, for their long-term academic English development to allow them to use English in an uh, in context, in really complex, interesting ways, and to ask them questions about their ideas that um, really engage the process of writing development in that way. So when we're thinking about what this looks like logistically, um, the most helpful advice that I have received in this area came from Regina Maciello when I first began teaching ex at Rutgers. And she told me, you never write a comment until you have finished reading the full paragraph. And I recognize that that sounds like really simple advice. Like, why was I not doing that before? Um, but when I first heard that advice, it helped me realize that my commenting practice was really reactive in nature. Um, I was responding to the things that were catching my attention um, in kind of a most dramatic way. And because I had a background in kind of editing and student journalism, it was often these language issues and often some of the lowest priority language issues were the things that were catching my attention um, most quickly. And so by making a commitment to never comment before I finished an entire paragraph or even better to read the whole paper once through before I begin the process of commenting, I found that it really helped me um, increase the level of space between this experience of reading and the response of commenting. And that that allows me to decide, okay, what are actually the most crucial comments that I wanna give for this section of the paper? And sure, sometimes a language issue uh, is something that I want to comment on, but most of the time, the most crucial comments are actually related to, in my case, analysis or thesis or an opportunity to ask the student to elaborate on a point that they're making. So what I want us to think about is when those language comments can be the most useful ones and in order to do that, um, Natalie is going to talk to us a little bit about how she does this in her own course. And this example is in the context of a course that is specifically focused on language acquisition. And so after we hear from Natalie, I want to think a little bit about um, really to what extent we can use the examples that she's going to give us as something we can emulate in a content course. And when there is an opportunity to, if we're not going to do this at the level that Natalie is kind of outlining for us to decide when to strategically not engage in that work so that we don't end up giving um, language feedback that does more harm than good. So Natalie, if you wanna um, jump in here whenever you're ready, I can click through the slides for you. Yeah, thank, that'd be great, Sean. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, yes, I want to I want to talk about prioritizing, just complementing what Sean has given us already in her presentation, and talk about um, focused language feedback and prioritizing feedback. So, from my experience, and I have when I first started teaching at Rutgers until now, I believe also I have changed a lot as an instructor, and I did at first, you know, I was noticing every um, grammar error, the verb tenses, the missing articles, and, and 
yes, we will notice them. But over time, with a lot of guidance from from um, directors and from coordinators and all the people who you know have helped along the way, I first look back at what I have assigned the students. What are the students working with? So in this case, I'm showing an example of a sequence of writing that I asked the students to do in intensive English as academic discourse, um, which was a, a course that RU Pathway students were taking that I taught in fall 2019. So first I looked back at, okay, what, what readings am I assigning for those students and if I want them to produce writing based on those readings, what are the most crucial skills that they will need for their writing? Um, so for example, in paper two, I'm asking them to engage with te texts that discuss stereotyping and labeling and identity. So I thought this would be a really valuable opportunity to bring in um, the language skill of how to avoid generalizing, right? Or moralizing language. Um, based on that context, right? So I ask myself these questions when I am creating work for them and then thinking about how I will prioritize my language feedback. What mm -hmm. academic language skill will my students need to learn or review to express their ideas in a clear and complex way? Additionally, to what extent will they implement that skill in the long term, right? So it's not just about the here and now, it is also about the usefulness of that skill moving forward in whatever discipline they're going to pursue. Um, okay, next slide, please. So I just have a few examples here of student work to really emphasize uh, the balance between content feedback and feedback on language. So in this paragraph, yes, there are verb tense errors, there are missing articles, there's capitalization you know, issues, but my focus I decided was going to be on generalizing language. So I ask myself, does, do the errors impede meaning? Do they disrupt logic, right? Or do they disrupt the persuasiveness of the student's ideas? So really working on this balance, I, and again, notice I didn't, I didn't comment on the missing articles and whatnot. I decided to focus on those, um, the avoiding generalizing language. And of course, if the student wants to meet me during office hours and talk about the other language, the other grammar, I'd absolutely do that and do, you know, a specialized kind of personalized review for them. That's part of what office hours can be for, in my opinion. Um, and then Sean, if you just go to the next slide. So again, this is another example and the students using never, where it's like always, you know, too, too definitive of language, in my opinion, for this for this um, essay, but also notice I do comment on, for example, the student needs to work on contextualizing the quotes that he or she is using. That's also incredibly important. Um, so again, it's that balance that I'm, that I'm hoping to emphasize here. Okay, and next slide, please. And then finally, I have um, a lesson that I've learned recently that I would love to share with all of you. And it's building on Sean's point of engaging with language variation. Um, so many of the students in RU Path are from mainland China and um, speak Mandarin as their first language along with other dialects throughout China. And often we will see in their papers these, what would commonly be perhaps commented as awkward word choice, which I am guilty of. I have done that in the past. Um, and I've really started to shift in viewing these students' word choices, like I had mentioned in my presentation previously, the cultural exchange, right? Um, uh, promoting this discussion with the students and having a conversation with them. So for example, for those of us who are using Canvas with our Rutgers courses, that doesn't have to just mean office hours. 
That could mean using the speed grader reply function, right? Part of the assignment might be for the students to reply to your comment and start a conversation. Or perhaps as Sean, actually, we had discussed together a reflection assignment, you know, following, um, following the work that they do. So also, I want to emphasize hearing the student's rationale. Why did they pick that word? What was the logic behind that word? Right? Again, they're navigating English with prior knowledge from their first language. So um, I've been trying to collaborate on meaning with the students, particularly this example, the student had used the word moisten um, because the warmth of the residents of a community moistened this man's feelings. Um, and so I asked her, instead of just saying, I don't know what you mean, right? I, or unclear word choice. I, I said, hey, let's talk about this in office hours. Like, what were you thinking in Chinese? And let's think about it in English. Now, um, we did talk about it. She explained how word choice can be different in Chinese. Words can be used in a literal and figurative sense, while in English it might just be a literal sense. So we were stuck on this word moist. And I was like, oh, right, like a cake is moist or the grass is moist. But actually, this was still a miscommunication on our part. It takes a lot of work because the word that she was thinking of, which I have in Chinese here, ran, means to infect. Right. And so, in fact, can be used in a literal and figurative sense in English. Also, I could have had the opportunity to explain, oh, right, his laughter was infectious. Right. I could have introduced that phrasing, but it was unfortunately a missed opportunity. But now I know. Right. So it was I tried to implement this strategy of communication with students, even though it wasn't fully successful, it's getting there. And that's what I would suggest, just starting the conversation with them, hearing, you know, their side of it. Um, it's incredibly fulfilling to have those conversations with the students. So I'll pass it back to uh, Sean. Thank Second you. So when I look at the, the level of work that Natalie is doing here, um, particularly around word choice, right? Commenting on this particular word and asking, okay, what did you mean here? Um, why did you choose that word? Now in my own course, which has more of a content focus, this is something that um, I would decide strategically when to engage in this kind of work. And so one of the key concepts that we work with with students in the writing program is the idea of key terms. And so I often decide strategically whether I'm going to do this kind of work or not based on whether this example of moistened appears in the student's thesis statement or if it appears buried in the bottom of page four. And if it's on the bottom of page four and I understand everything else that's going on except for that word, I could skip it or I could just flag it and say like, hey, maybe we should talk about this in the future. But really directing the vast majority of my energy to the terms that are most central to the argument the student is developing. And when I ask students a question like, okay, why did you choose a word like moistened? What I often find is that even if I don't have the shared language context to do this real back and forth about, okay, what word um, in another language are you using here? when the student starts the process of explaining their thought process, you often get access to other vocabulary that they have that um, could be useful for you to tap into. And so I particularly find that when I'm working with students, they'll sometimes uh, be using a really abstract noun as their key term. And we're having kind of a translation issue with this abstract noun. But then in the process of them explaining, they give me some really concrete vocabulary related to um, the text that we're working with or the population that they're describing. And then I can say to them, oh, actually, what if that word appeared in your thesis statement? Or what would it look like to um, bring some of this more concrete terminology into um, the, the project that you're developing? And I think this kind of goes back to something that Natalie Oh, guys, I'm going to take a risk here and I'm going to try and go back on the PowerPoint. I may or may not recover my slide. Let's see. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so when I look at the language focus here, what I find so interesting about this is that a lot of the, these language focus items 
could be extremely useful for students that we would categorize as mainstream monolingual uh, students from New Jersey public schools, right? Thinking about avoiding generalizing language, I would love for all of my students to learn that lesson. And so when we start these collaborations about meeting with students, we can often help them tap into these questions that are really at the center, the center of our curriculum, right? How do you write a thesis that is a specific claim about the text that you're working with rather than an abstract statement about like what people have done since the beginning of time? And so I really try to limit my engagement with students um, language issues to parts of the essay or parts of the argument that I think will really leverage something for their, um, for the argument that they're trying to build and when they will not do so to just kind of let them go if that is at all possible. Um, now I often get feedback that this is um, potentially irresponsible in some way, or that we need to, re like we have the ability to help students, so we should be helping in this way. And I, I hear particularly from faculty who work with first year students, this idea that we should kind of be tough on language now, we should fix the problem now, because it's going to somehow protect students from uh, future language discrimination that they might face. And what I want to think about is whether we can situate some of the work that we're doing within the really long arc of language development that our students are working in. Over the course of a single semester, particularly a single semester course that's not actively focused on language acquisition, I think we need to be um, a little bit more humble about the impact that we are going to have on um, like particularly on student vocabulary and think about how we can really um, leverage what we do have to offer students, which is our content level expertise and the, the way that you can really push the student to develop argumentation and engage with their ideas in a really deep and responsive way. Um, I think it's particularly important because for those of us who teach at moments that really represent kind of the leveling up of academic argumentation, so those of us who are in first year writing programs, all of our students are often being pushed um, to really the limits of their communicative skills. And this is something that can, uh, anyone who remembers their own early dissertation process knows that their uh, language clarity often really suffered in that moment. And so that's sometimes is a really natural aspect of students' language being kind of pushed to its extreme. And we wanna be really cautious about labeling multilingual students as somehow unprepared in that moment when really what is sometimes happening is that we as instructors are um, unaccustomed to being challenged by writing that is, I would say that's being pushed to its limits in a way that we're maybe not as accustomed to reading. So in that way, I like to really think about how can I develop as a reader of um, my multilingual students writing and what can I accept as a uh, reasonable writing accent for the assignments that I'm working with. And as we think about that, I want to share something from uh, one of my students. And so this is something that a student of mine who was uh, being educated in the U.S. for the first time, he had previously been educated in um, mainland China and in Singapore. And he writes this in his cover letter for his final paper. I wish you to understand that for me, English is, English is not something intuitive slash inherent. When it comes to, I cannot see my page now, one moment, sorry. You all can read it, so I'm just gonna let you read it. Um, and what I think is really interesting here is that we're seeing a student who clearly has a level of English to engage in a complex academic argument. And he is interpreting the struggle of writing these advanced research papers as in some way indicative of 
a, a failure of his level of English proficiency. And he repeatedly writes and says things throughout the semester, like, I hope that my, um, I hope that my paper is worthy to stand among that of my peers. And this is something that happens a lot in my classes because we have a very small class. So even though I have a lot of multilingual and international students, I often have a seminar where I'll have one student who is being educated in the US for the very first time and everyone else has um, either had their full education or their high school education in the US. And so when you read the students uh, writing here, I think this paragraph is really indicative of the way he kind of communicated in his academic prose as well. It's really sophisticated, but it also has a writing accent. And it was really important for me to not comment on that writing accent with the help, with the hope of kind of minimizing language variation and even less so to catch him like once or twice when he would make a subject verb agreement error, because this was a student who really needed his, uh, needed to be validated in the fact that academic writing is and should be a struggle and that he was really on the right track. And we only really needed to talk about language variation when it came to keyword choice, particularly in the very beginnings of his paper and the very end of his paper. So um, I just wanted to leave you with this example of the ways that students, um, even students who are achieving at a really high level, are often very hard on themselves and their own um, self-assessment of their language skills. And so are there ways that we can um, communicate with our students in ways that um, really validate the work that they're doing and avoid communicating that they're not prepared to do the work that we're asking them to do because of their multilingual backgrounds. So I will leave you there. Sean, I think that's great. It answers a bunch of questions that we had uh, the registrants asked about how do you build trust how do you build rapport? Uh, how do you build confidence? And um, how do you encourage um, multilingual writers to be critical of other writers' work in critical review? So all of those things, you know, are questions that are coming up, um, how best to earn the trust and the rapport um, through writing feedback of students. So that, that was a very common question uh, thread. Yeah, I think one way logistically that I do this, and again, I'm speaking as someone who's working within a program that um, sets a lot of the larger expectations of how um, assignments will be structured and how grading will occur. But there's a portion of our grading standards that are related to, um, it's sort of the participation component of the grade. And I found that this is an area where I actually have a lot of flexibility. And so I... Um, base that portion of the grade almost entirely on um, kind of reflective work that the students do. And then some of the ways that I kind of provide students to have a moment to think about this or to kind of engage in a larger conversation is all students can do a reflection at the beginning of the semester about how the writing expectations of this course are similar to and different from their previous writing expectations. And so you get everything here from, uh, I previously only wrote, uh, you know, short essay questions as part of standardized tests to, well, I actually did a really extensive research project, but it was different in these specific ways. And that allows us to start these kinds of conversations about, okay, where was the thesis in your previous writing instruction? And where is the thesis going to be in the papers that you'll do for this course. And I find that those conversations are as helpful for international students as they are for um, just students who are from a range of academic backgrounds domestically. I wanted to- uh, I think, oh, uh, go ahead, Natalie, yeah. I just wanted to mention, I see in the chat, there's discussion of grading rubrics. And I just wanted to, I had thought back to, I taught um, expository writing for the first time in fall 2018. And I believe somebody correct me if I'm wrong, 
But that was the year that the grading rubric for XBOS was revised and the, the entire um, structural column for, for language use was revised. Um, and so, yes, the, the idea of the, if somebody wants to add on, <laughs> add on to this, but um, yes, I think in within the writing program specifically, this shift is has been happening um, at Rutgers for the past couple of years. And so it is taking time, but it, it is happening for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I honestly think that change was happening when I was teaching in XBOS as well. I, um, I think that there was a lot of opportunity to uh, de-emphasize like the catching of errors. Thank you, um, Sean and Natalie. Um, I think we will move on to the last presentation um, to give um, Dr. Chisi Zhang enough time uh, to do hers. And the topic that um, Dr. Chisi uh, Zhang is going to be uh, presenting on is scaffolding um, group work and participation through literacy circles. So with that, I give it to Dr. Chisi Zhang, who is an instructor. Um, of uh, an EAD course at uh, Rally. Well, thank you. I really love you know uh, to uh, to have Nella give some background introduction first before before my presentation. Yeah, go ahead, Nella. Yeah, Chisi, thank you so much. Um, I will make this uh, very brief. Um, uh, referring back to um, Sean and uh, Natalie's wonderful. Uh, examples of um, responding to student work and scaffolding. Um, I want to contextualize Chisi's work uh, and, and, and connect it back to um, the work that we're doing in EAD. Uh, Sean and Natalie spoke extensively about the negotiation of meaning process. And that's part of this idea of changing away from, you know, uh, uh, avoiding ideas of difference and, and embracing difference. Uh, and I think that Chisi does this uh, consistently and, and, and really well, because what she's about to discuss with you is something that uh, uh, many of our colleagues are currently doing uh, in our EAP courses, which is the value of group work as that another space for that negotiation of meaning, particularly in discussing, in discussing and focusing on the ideas that students have. Uh, Chisi's work also is another example of the cross, the working across cultures, which is so integral to the work of Relly, because um, what she has done is, is leverage the value and the importance that group work has in the context of an Eastern classroom from which many of our students are coming from. I'm referring to China in particular in the, in the case of the course that, T, that Chisi is gonna be speaking about and, and really maximizing the opportunities that collaborative and co-constructing uh, uh, you know, sensibilities and, and practices have on our students who are accustomed to working in, in ways uh, with group work that um, perhaps are their, their US counterparts uh, are not so uh, perhaps used to, to, to doing. I'll, I'll make one comment at the end uh, after, if, if there's time um, to, to further contextualize. So just wanted to, to draw your attention to, to, to how critical this is, this is to the work of EAD and how it reflects back to the work that our colleagues have done in the course of the last hour and a half, uh, and, and very importantly to the, the mission and the work of Relly. So Chisi, thank you so much. Thank you, Nella. Okay, um, well, especially in this remote teaching context, it seems like we are always playing hide and seek with students, right? Uh, so a group work is even more important. Well, but I, I mean, um, I, I, well, I would like to introduce, I mean, to emphasize something probably that is new and not new, you know, based on, you know, the, the chat box messages and uh, my fellow panelists discussions here. Okay, so, so I want to start with uh, the kind of comparison between Eastern culture and the Western culture, you know, to answer, uh, to get back to the question someone just answered. Okay, um, so as we know, you know, when, when we think about the uh, kind of a core value of American cultures, what is the key word, right? So probably we all agree that, most of us will agree that it is uh, individualism, okay? So individualism is, is like a, a typical feature of this, uh, this, uh, this host culture for those international students or the multilingual learners here as well, okay? Well, in contrast, these students, okay, the Chinese students, you know, the uh, Korean students, 
Okay, Indian students, they come from a very different culture. Well, um, I just realized, you know, um, after listening to this, so many uh, discussions, it's not just uh, different, it is really, it's, it's kind of dichotomy. Okay, so it's dichotomy between the two cultures. So, okay, so so I, I just want you to remember, okay, in my presentation here, um, always remember this comparison between these two words. One is individualism, the other is exactly the country, okay? They are, they, exactly the opposite is the collectivism. Okay, so in, uh, in, uh, in our culture, American culture, okay, here, okay, uh, this individualistic culture, Western culture represented by America, European countries, right, Canada, uh, that promotes independence, equality, and self-achievement. Now look at the left, okay? The collectivist culture promotes Instead, interdependence. It's not, I'm sorry, it's not equality, but uh, you know, um, respect for authority. Okay, and then the hierarchical, hierarchical roles and relationship. So you see the self in this culture is not really that important. It's not really highlighted. Okay, and then and another example, okay. Um, I mean, represented clearly in American higher education, American higher education nurtures self-expression, critical thinking, that really is consistent with this core value of, of uh, the individualist culture. Okay, now in China, for example, that is also representative of this Eastern culture. When a person is in need of something, whether it's information, financial assistance, or you know, social emotional support even, or otherwise, they will not turn to some, somebody probably professional, okay? But they will turn to someone he knows. And then who in turn may turn to someone he knows. And then who knows someone else. So you can see the difference between here. Now this is exactly exemplified, okay? Presented, played in our, in our classroom. Um, so this is a ready context as Anella has introduced. Okay, so I'm using my current course, Rose 152, which is a ready course, writing course. Um, kind of, you know, combined with the basic comp as, a, as an example here, okay? I designed this literature circle activity after I have the students, um, you know, posted their self-introduction video on Canvas and they finished their first assignment. Okay, I think it's time to group them, okay? Um, and then this literature circle is based on their writing, uh, but it's basically randomly grouped, okay? Because I don't, I cannot exactly tell who is really advanced uh, at the English level and who is not because it's really early uh, in the semester. Okay, and my grouping is also based on the students' kind of informal survey and their preferences. So I group them in a, you know, a circle, a circle of four or five people. This is what they prefer, you know, to have. And also, I, you know, um, explicitly explain the objectives. Um, regarding this uh, literature circle in uh, written files, documents, also in my videos, class meeting recordings as well. So this is um, the two files I have, uh, you know, uh, provided to the students before they actually go into the literature circle activity. So when we look at this right file, okay, uh, these guidelines basically um, you know, works as a kind of pre-activity scaffolding. As you know, we have heard so much today, right? Um, so, so when we remember students from Eastern cultures tend to be interdependent on each other, okay? They may not you know, initiate asking a question or, you know, um, or organizing something probably, okay? So that is why I, I, really, in, I really introduce everything in great detail. Okay, so first of all, I included four rows, which are rotated, you know, in a, within a circle. Well, these four rows I designed here um, are also related to, you know, our, our writing um, gr grading rubric. Okay, so that is close uh, related as well. Now, this will also be presented, you know, uh, in, in their probably quizzes, in their essay writing. Okay, so, so this is how I introduce this circle here. Okay, um, how should they, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so they 
um, they, what should they do before that, okay? And then they should not just focus on play just one role in every circle for every project, okay? Uh, and then each group uh, should, should post their, 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 their work as a group, not individually, okay? And then all the members will get the same grade. So, so all of these things, I also mentioned that, you know, this, um, you know, group work, each circle work really depend on both their independent work and their collaboration. So I really give a very detailed guidelines before I, you know, assign the students to the active work, okay? Um, and then on the left, this is a chart, okay? Where, you know, you can also see, um, I include not only the students' names, but also their ID numbers, okay? I even you included an example about how to contact each other with the email, uh, you know, uh, provided here. So I include the ID number because with the ID number followed by scarletmail.edu, that will be, you know, the email address of each student. And then with different colors, they will know what groups they belong to. Okay, so basically this is the pre-activity scaffolding. Of course, you know, in each class meeting, students will again come to ask me, you know, uh, and then we come to the during activity scaffolding stage. Okay, at this stage, I will value more their cross-cultural experiences as, you know, uh, the other panelists have mentioned. I will continue to encourage collaboration, you know, both in, uh, you know, my written message and my meeting uh, as well. Okay, and I also, you know, try to activate their prior knowledge. Um, um, you know, as we said, across cultural uh, knowledge as well, right? That they have been living in their home countries for, for such a long time, right? Uh, so, uh, and, and again, I will continue to provide explicit instructions, uh, detailed review of assignments. I will send reminders as well, okay, to both the group members, okay, to check on how they are doing. Okay, and clarify more information. I will also send reminders to those absent members, okay, who I don't know, seem to be like, you know, like, like, a, like a late bloomers, okay, in this, in this circle. Okay, and then finally, I also encourage one-on-one -on -one meeting, okay, if they feel uncomfortable working with their circle members, you know, they can come to me, uh, schedule a meeting anytime. I'm so sorry. Um, okay, so now, very probably, you know, we, we, we tend to feel um, after we assigned the, 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 the different circles, okay, and the guidelines, we don't have to, to do anything, but actually, you know, the during activity is just as important as the, the pre-activity. It is a whole process, okay. Um, so the scaffolding is kind of, uh, you know, going on through this whole activity. Now, finally, we come to the post-activity scaffolding. Okay, uh, how do I know that? Okay, how do I know that? Uh, because uh, I also included this part in uh, the student's quiz, okay, as I just mentioned earlier. Okay, so I just want to know whether they know what they should do, what their roles are, and then what are their, you know, responsibilities, okay, uh, related to that role. Okay, so this is what I have selected from my uh, students' responses. In literature circle, I played the role of quotation connector and I need to clarify the connection between the text quoted in the article. Well, this is just a part of the response. So you see um, the name is correct, you know, it's, it's really accurate, okay? And then what is the role supposed to do? That is also clear, okay? And then the next one is the outlining director, okay? I answer the first and second question for my group and tell my group how to understand the author's statement and share my reader response with my circle, okay? So this is a different role, okay? And the next one, my literature circle gives wider and better ideas about the two readings and also have a stake to speak my view towards the readings. I, I guess, okay, very often they will just use their native language, right? Um, we work as a team, okay? We complete the cooperation task more efficiently, so on and so. So you can tell the students really benefit much more from this literature circle. Okay, the last one, you know, interestingly, you know, I even had goosebumps when I read this message um, because the students, while they are working as a group, okay, it's a collective 
efforts, right? But their individual leadership is also kind of uh, developed in this process. Now look at these efforts here, right? I've been proactively looking for my group mates through Scarlet Mail, Canvas, WeChat, you know, the cross-cultural, uh, you know, uh, apps online, um, you know, so this, this student has been, has been, uh, has been uh, using um, in this whole process. Eventually I found most of them and schedule a time meeting them. Before the meeting, I opened the Zoom room as my group mates don't know how to do it, you know? So you see this kind of a leadership is also, you know, um, it's, also, it's also trained in this whole process. Okay, now, so to sum up, these are some of the outcomes, academic outcomes especially, okay, um, from uh, this activity. Um, well, just, you know, just to name a few here, okay? So first off, we can see um, the students is clear about their, their goals, right? They know what they should do. Uh, they, 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 they are, the objectives are really clear to them, okay? And then they have developed their community building skills as well, okay? Just how I can negotiate with my group members, okay? Be, be, before I go beyond this, uh, you know, uh, literature circle level and go to a whole classroom, uh, discussion, okay? And of course, this also promotes critical thinking because they can hear different perspectives, okay? Um, they will hear different voices as well. And they can also have this stage where to make their own voice, okay? Uh, this also develops critical reading and writing skills um, because they, this literature circle includes a role where they need to to, to find out how to connect the two readings, okay? How do they understand, interpret, you know, two quotes from, from the two texts? So uh, as I said earlier, it is closely related to their reading and writing skills, okay? And this also promotes the learner's agency, okay? Well, they make their voice, they take this ownership um, of this learning by themselves. Um, but finally, it also embraces the trans disciplinary and the transcultural perspectives as well. So I would just say, um, this is just what the students have, have benefited, right? Uh, but actually not really shown here, which is invisible, but it's embedded here in the list is what I have benefited as a professor, right? Um, I have also become a professor with a global perspective, you know, throughout this whole process. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, um, yeah, I just you know encourage everyone to try this. Um, I think this is a this is a very good experience. You know. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, yeah, we will be surprised. You will be surprised. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, GC. This was excellent. Um, any questions? For um, for Chisi Zhang or any of the other panelists who participated, we have uh, we have about ten minutes. Chisi, quickly, um, I think one that you had just spoke to that um, you might want to expand on in the questions that the registrants uh, sent. One was on giving advice to multilingual instructors on how to apply their experience writing in another language to how they address their learners. Um, other questions also related to helping peer leaders who are multilingual apply their experience um, to help students in their writing process. So if you want to field that one or if anyone else um, for multilingual instructors. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I think probably that is easier, right? Because they understand each other. Uh, it's not really cross-cultural, but they share the same culture. Uh, so I would say probably just don't hesitate to just share your experience, whether it is experience or lessons, you know, uh, what well, that will also help. Well, on the other hand, I will also say um, probably, as we just said, this is the, this is the kind of uh, features of Eastern culture, most Eastern cultures, right? They seem to be passive, okay? They seem to be waiting there. Uh, so, so probably you need to initiate um, you know, kind of a scaffold to help them answer the question. I mean, ask the question first, okay? Before they, they, they ask other things, before they, they start doing other things, they need to know how to ask questions. 
So I think that can be even the very, very first step. I don't know whether that answers the question. I think they were also looking for maybe um, if, uh, you know, you or the other panelists specific sort of best practices for a multilingual peer leader or a multilingual instructor to um, uh, specific resources or tools that they can use um, to sort of bridge that multilingualism in them to the multilingualism they find in their students. Uh, well, before anyone else wants to say something, but I also want to add, you know, just to keep encouraging whether the peers, you know, uh, students or the leaders, you know, just to keep encouraging them saying, this is good, you know, how can I help you, whatever. Um, well, I think encouragement is very important. Well, and probably later on, we want our encouragement to be more and more specific, more and more, you know, uh, concrete. I think that will also help. If I can add to that, um, that I would share with <clears throat> with um, with multilingual instructors is that is that they're actually, as and Nicole mentioned this earlier in her first slide, there are no quick tips um, or one size fits all. Um, the key term is to be responsive. Again, Sean and Natalie and Mark and Mata um, also, and of course TC uh, also uh, pointed that out. And I, I think I find that when I share that with other um, multilingual faculty, but also tutors, that um, we all, people often come to us for you know the bag of tricks, and and I think the kind of recognition that being that celebrating and embracing difference means exactly that. It means being responsive in that context, in that moment, at that time, and not a checklist. If you if you if you have a checklist, you again render it. Uh, meaningless and useless and secondary, which is what, which is part of the problem in the first place, that these conversations are, have often been considered secondary, marginalized. Um, but I also think one thing that I, I like to share, uh, and this goes back to um, someone whose work is really critical uh, to, to this kind of translingualism, multilingualism, is Ophelia Garcia, who um, reminds us of the social justice work of this, of all of this. There's a social justice component to this work that is often hard to, you know, gets lost in the shuffle or is hard to um, sometimes admit to. And that is that we're not, you know, uh, a multilingual faculty, staff, uh, tutors. Um, we, what we represent is a possibility of multiple, uh, the possibility not of, multiple different people, but of embodying a, a wide spectrum and a wide range uh, or trajectory of linguistic and cultural repertoires. So, you know, I always tell people, I'm not Spanish speaking Nella, I'm not English speaking Nella, I'm Nella who speaks these two languages and other languages as well. And I try to leverage those resources when they're needed for the context that they're needed for at the time that they're needed. So I find that to be, you know, again, it's, it's, it's about, changing, it's, it's a, I think Joanne in the, sh in the um, chat function talked about a paradigm shift. At Rally, we talk about it as a disposition shift. It's a way of, of being and thinking uh, that then informs the practices, the perspectives and the products that we are trying to you know, produce or, or create in, in our context. So anyway, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I, I would like to add just quickly about that, because um, I had noted that as well, um, talking about that disposition. And what is crucial is uh, more in examining how you're engaging in that space of fact, myth, right, and all of the things that we have talked about. And so if you're multilingual, that doesn't necessarily say how you're engaged with that or not, um, because you can be reiterating, um, you know, discriminatory policies, practices, because that has been, you know, the paradigm you've been working under. So, you know, what assumptions are you making about students? The first fact, so just that sort of basic fact and myth, are you assuming students to, you know, be monolingual, you know, who are you teaching? Are you taking that inquiry based approach? And also, you know, acknowledging your positionality, no matter where it's coming from within the larger social cultural context, how we define language, culture, language teaching. This is where this type of work and this orientation resides. And this is what's essential for moving forward, because whatever practices you have, if they're from that top down assimilationist perspective, you they will you will enact that. But if you have a disposition toward 
multilingualism, linguistic justice, diversity, you'll enact that as well. Um, so it's really examining, um, you know, what you know, where, uh, you know, engaging how much you've engaged with these ideas. Um, and, and how you reconcile, uh, I had mentioned in the, in the comments, your idea, if your idea of academic writing is completely narrow and assimilationist, how do you reconcile your mission for inclusive teaching and a diverse voices um, within the academy, within your classroom? Um, so it's really, you know, starting from there. And I think um, Rashida has a, has a question that I saw her hand raise and, and mentioned in the chat, so. Thank you so much uh, for that, Nicole. And my question was for, and I want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. Kesey? Did I say it wrong? Oh, well, it's okay. No, it's, it's not. <laughs> okay. And so I don't see when you were uh, when you were sharing your experience, I too in my courses, I have created, mm -hmm. I call them collaborative learning groups um, okay. in my classes. And I see that students appreciate that because it gives them a chance to engage outside of the class, work through their confusion. They come up with questions and I teach them how to interrogate the text. And I wonder from your experience using this approach, have you seen that it um, increases student engagement in your class? Yeah, I think so. Actually, you know, my, my, uh, the list I present in the final slide, you know, is much longer. But you know, I just uh, I just left out something uh, because of you know the time limit. Indeed, you know, actually, students who actively participate in a literature circle will also participate in class discussion actively as well. So probably I should have mentioned this as well. Their confidence is also you know kind of uh, built up in this process. So so I would say probably. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of transition process from uh, being uh, collectivist, collectivistic, right? To individualistic, but you know, there can be a transition. So probably from a collectivist, a big circle to, to a, a big circle of class, to a small circle of literature, and then probably to individual. So, so probably it's a step-by-step, -step. but in this process, an instructor, a professor cannot be just a hands-off from the very beginning because, you know, it's not their culture. They just don't know how to start. Once, you know, they are, you know, this kind of activities, uh, they are launched. They will just uh, run, you know, around, you know, uh, along that orbit. But the, the initial force is really very important, I would say. Well, thank I, you for, you know, your raising that question. Yeah, yeah, uh, Professor Yang. I agree. Do you mind if I respond back to that or do we have time to move on? I see somebody else with a question. I'll send you an email if that's okay. Sure. Uh, thank you, Rashida. I don't see um, anyone else um, in the group asking a question right now. Okay. Um, you want to go ahead. Michaela has her hand raised. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay, Michaela. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Yes. Um, so, uh, my, my, can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. So, my question was to, can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Siri pops in and asks me what I need. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, so my question, I guess we I wanted to like um, take into account a, another layer in this process, which is the expectations that our students have, first year students coming into our um, writing courses, multilingual students um, that expect a certain I'm just saying. rigor. I guess when it comes to grammar, they're constantly mentioning the need for grammar corrections. And it's it's very, very difficult to reconcile this with the practices we are we are trying to implement. So I think it's just another layer in the process. That's what I'm trying to say. You know, it's uh, that's kind of what I'm, I'm getting at. And I think Cheesy brought that in a little bit. Um, thank you. I can't hear myself and I can't hear anybody. So I'm just going to mute myself. Yes, thank you, Mihela. We actually heard you perfectly. Um, sorry that you can't hear us. Um, 
Any other uh, last minute comments uh, before we, we wrap up? I see that Flora has actually posted um, a takeaway for all of you. Um, it's uh, the Rally Guide um, to inclusive teaching, inclusive classroom community for multilingual learners. So, so please go ahead and, and, and download that. It's an excellent resource. And um, maybe Nicole, you would like to say some uh, last, last things to just wrap up the session. Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's a great turnout. Um, you know, uh, actually, to respond to um, what Mihaela just had asked, it's about, again, uh, contextualizing that grammar and calling attention to looking at audience, right? What reader perspective, what struck, what are the structural choices you're making? Um, you know, how does that affect your local meaning, overall meaning? So making those connections rather than just rote grammar rules, right? So it's not eliminating, it's expanding and contextualizing. So that's, you know, the advocacy. Unfortunately, the opposite view of that, that deficit top-down model is like an all or nothing approach. And so whenever we say, oh, change how, you know, the position of grammar, it's like, no, but you're, that, that philosophy and ideology is sort of then placed onto an expansive approach. When we're saying this is an eliminating, this is expanding. Um, and so there's that tension there. And it's, again, as we've seen creating that community balancing, being explicit, right? Understanding the process, right? And then also working from a space of inquiry, understanding, strengths, the resources, the great, the wide linguistic repertoire and cultural repertoire of students and faculty in a, multi, in a multilingual space in which we are. Um, and I think that's a sort of transi transition, great sort of end to wrap everything up. Um, and I hope that this was informative. If you have any questions about Rally at all or would like to discuss this further or collaborate, um, I'm also a co-director in a, uh, a new initiative in SAS Humanities of Language and Social Justice with the Language Engagement Project. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I'd be happy to, to speak with you. And thank you, um, Anu. Thank you, Flora. Thank you, everyone, for being here, all of the presenters. Um, it was it was a, a great turnout, and I hope that um, you you got a lot from uh, this event today. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole, and and thank you to Chris Drew and uh, the other sponsor, and to all of you for attending this. Uh, please do reach out to to Relly. Uh, you know them all now. Uh, with any other questions that you have, collaborations that you would like to make with them. And uh, we hope to keep doing these kind of panels more frequently. Um, and, and please do um, reach out to other faculty um, and encourage that they uh, work with Relly on, on this um, very important work. So thank you all, stay safe, stay well. And it was really great to see everyone. Thank you.